Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? Remember when we covered Spawn comics? Feels like it's been forever. Well, I guess it's time to get nostalgic. That's the theme for this channel. As we go back and check out Spawn number 11 by Todd McFarlane and Frank Miller. So just before we get into this, if you enjoy the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, what you can do is in the description, there's a link to my Patreon. And if you subscribe there, that'll give you access to everything I do. From the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon exclusive content. So yeah, this is spot number 11. This is the fourth of the Creator's Choice issues, the, where, where Todd um, hired writers to give him ideas for Spawn and then didn't compensate them properly. That whole deal. And this is, for me at least, kind of the black sheep of this group. Uh, I mean, the other three ones, uh, number eight by Alan Moore, number nine by Neil Gaiman, and number ten by Dave Sim, I reread those over and over. This one, I, I might have reread once. This is one of those instances where it feels like Todd got a guy who he respects the shit out of, I think, but who just wasn't appropriate for this kind of book at all. And, you know, Frank was down to do him a solid. Sin City was doing gangbusters. And I think he was trying to be part of that legend group for a little while. So, you know, solidarity among independent creators and shit. Oh, what? You mean I got to write about this fucking magical, super-powered homeless dude who fights demons when he's not too busy moping? And yeah, that does seem right up my street there. Okay, so in this one, Spawn and the, the bums are going to get involved in the dumbest gang war you've ever heard of. So let's get into this. Uh, we'll start with the cover. That's, a, I mean, that's actually quite a good one, really. Very detailed, lots of figures, and you get like a triangular kind of composition with everything leading up to Spawn here. And just in case you missed him, the big old fucking cape flying out every which way. Also, it has that factor of, um, you know, if you're familiar with this issue, you know exactly which one it is just from the cover. If you remember what happens. And good luck on that one. So, let's get into this. So, this is Home. Okay. Uh, story Frank Miller, Art Todd McFarlane, Tom Arzachowski, Steve Olaf, Ruben, you know, it's, it's fucking all-stars, theoretically. Okay, so we're going to start things out with a big old splash. And uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a first for the last few issues. And this is Spawn waking up in the alley to, uh, to one of the bums here. And the premise here is that the last few issues have been a dream on Spawn's part, particularly the last one, because he's, you know, I mean, he's coming directly from that, but that was the one with Cerebus, and he's not really him, and he's traveling in between worlds, and what the fuck am I doing talking to a talking aardvark, all that kind of stuff. Decent enough splash, I, I mean, you know, it's not exactly a cool shot, but I guess it's kind of intriguing, and pretty solid drawing, you know, can't complain. So yeah, Spawn is thrashing around in the alley as he comes to from Erebus, and his buddies have to try and snap him out of it. So the big one here is going to smack him around a little bit until he kind of clears his head. So this is Bobby and Boots. And he goes, uh, oh, that was too damn weird. Demons and New Age Girls, so that's issue 8. And Really Mean Angels, issue 9. And a talking aardvark. A talking aardvark. He smoked, too. It's a fun line, anyway. It is a little weird to have that last issue be fully diegetic, like it, it does actually fit into the world. Uh, it, it was kind of its own standalone thing. Uh, if you missed the discussion about Spawn number 10, you can always go back and watch that. Me and my buddy Jay talked about it for like an hour. So, okay, yeah, Spawn is, is reasonably coherent now. And talking about aardvarks makes these guys go, oh yeah, uh, usually with me it's uh, rats and lizards and beetles. And uh, Boots like, yeah, I get mostly bats, it's the wine. So it makes sense. Uh, a couple of homeless guys here, I'm talking about talking aardvarks. And they're going to assume, yeah, okay, so you, you just had a bad night then. And Spawn says, but I don't drink, damn it. And Bobby says, um, you know, you've been with us for a while. If we haven't heard anything out of you yet, not even a, so much as a she done me wrong. Um, uh, who are you anyway? And he's like, ah, it doesn't matter. It's like Boots over there. He's got those boots. And he loves them, so we call them Boots. And... All I've got is you guys in this alley, and you're my friends, and this is my home, like the title of this story. So you can just call me Bum Alley, I guess. And this is all just kind of wasting time. I guess you don't want to drop right into whatever the story is. You want to build up a little bit. Except Todd's on the clock. He's going to take a long time on these pages, so he can't exactly, you know, you can't crank out a 40-page story or something, because Todd's never going to have time to do that. 
So, like, a wasted page like this is actually, like, burning up quite a bit of real estate. There's a reasonable amount of detail on this, at least. You know, I, I guess mostly in this panel here. Um, I, this one, uh, it feels like he's easing up a little bit. Like, or, you know, just maybe, again, getting close to the end of this run that he's doing. Um, he did go pretty hard on the last three issues for detail. So this one, uh, maybe a little bit less so. Yeah, looking for shortcuts and stuff. I mean, you can see it here. But anyway, a big old explosion goes off somewhere in the alley. So Spawn races off towards it. Bobby thinks that that's got to be the cops. Spawn says, nope, it's a 50 millimeter tsunami. It's Japanese. Cops don't use it. It's military. Because Spawn used to be a soldier. So he knows what, you know, this particular gun sounds like. That's, that's fair. So this particular gun is a handheld tank stopper. It can reduce a Bradley to shrapnel with a single shot. Hmm. Okay. Use it on a human and you're talking spaghetti sauce. Lumpy kind. That's a Frank Miller line. Uh, there is a problem with the Frank Miller dialogue in this super flashy book. Like, you can see the Frank Miller dialogue if it's in a Frank Miller book. It makes sense, particularly with, like, his lettering. You pop it in here with all this super glossy color and this super slick lettering and the word balloons with the extra circle around it that's all digitally separated. And it's it, it doesn't fit. Like, even just this boom... With the extra shadow underneath. It doesn't fit in, in a Frank Miller script. So anyway, the explosion goes off, knocks this girl flying. She goes right into spawn here. And I guess he kind of breaks her fall. And, you know, the only thing she's able to say is save me. And then another shot comes through that cuts through the both of them. And he says, uh, they'd both be spaghetti sauce now if Al Simmons were still alive. But for the girl, it doesn't make a speck of difference. For the girl, dead is dead. Decent enough line. And Todd put in some time on this page, here at least. I guess this one does kind of demand for some detail. So maybe saved himself a little bit of time here so that he could put an extra, that kind of thing. But he can't just, you know, like, noodle forever on every page. He's got to be careful about which pages he does it on. And this is essentially two splashes that are just chewing up real estate. So, big guy comes in. I'm going to guess his name is Boomer because it's written on his head. That seems like a Frank Miller kind of thing. Bobby goes, you killed my pal. Boomer goes, maybe I'll kill you too. I got a bad case of the nasties tonight. And then Spawn, who has a hole in him, stands up and goes, me too. Bad case. Your fault. And grabs the big old tank busting gun off him. Decent enough pages. I guess this is the big badass shot. I don't know. It doesn't strike me as particularly cool. We've seen this already. Like We've seen Spawn walking around with a hole in his chest. That's nothing new now. But I guess he hasn't seen it, so that's that's the big shocking thing. You know, it's, I don't know, maybe it's part of Frank Miller scripting this. I'm sure he read all the issues leading up to this. But it still feels a little bit like he was uh, kind of unfamiliar with the comic. Just maybe in some respect. I don't know. Because, like, somebody being shocked that Spawn didn't die. Like, that that is old news already. So, Boomer runs off. Bobby's freaking out. Because first Spawn is talking about, uh, dreaming about talking aardvarks. Then he's dead. Then he's not dead. Then he's got that punk right where he wants him. Then he lets him go. And there's still a hole through him that uh, is bigger than his fist. So Bobby's confused. So Spawn has been dropped into the situation where he doesn't know what's going on. He just knows there's some kind of battle being waged. And the alley seems to have been sucked into it somehow. He has to spend a little bit of his energy to heal himself up. I don't see why. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess you can't go running around with a big old hole. It'd just be, you know, it'd just be silly looking. But at the same time, he seems to be able to get fine with a hole in his chest. And he can't really spare the energy. So just, you know, like maybe walk around with a hole in your chest for a little while. It's not, it doesn't seem like it's going to hurt you that much. And yeah, after healing himself, Bobby uh, has had enough for one night. He's just kind of like, okay, okay I'm, I'm just kind of done. And Spawn goes off to follow Boomer and find out what's been going on. And we're going to waste another page on a big splash. It's a nice looking one, at least. All sorts of background detail with the buildings and everything. Looks great. Nice pose. Cool angle. A little weird with all the uh, the uplighting and the lack of holding lines. But then I guess that's a little bit in theme for a book that has Frank Miller involved. Okay, so follows him down the alley. Whole bunch of detail in here. All sorts of trash in the in the alley here. And then up into a building. And yeah, still with the detail. Not so much here. 
So Spawn's going to perch on the roof and listen in. So Boomer is going to report to his gang, which is the nerds. And those of us familiar with Frank Miller's scripts might roll our eyes a little bit. This feels like a fallback for Frank Miller, but he doesn't know what to do. It's like ever since the mutant gang in Dark Knight Returns, he's like, I've got to keep bringing that shit back. Well, I mean, there was the mutant gang, there was the, the Batman, there was the Joker gang. You know, he did he did all those sorts of shit in that book. And now that's like his thing. So from there you get like Robocop 2 with the little kid gang. Or is that RoboCop 3? I don't even fucking know. One of them had like a Little League gang, I think. You could even branch it out a little bit to Sin City with the gang full of hookers. I mean, that is what they are, basically, right? As a gang. And now we've got the nerds. And the nerds are versus the creeps. So this is low-effort Frank Miller gangs. They say here, white middle-class computer geek street gangs. Which is like, okay, I guess that's an idea. It's... All right. So Boomer tells his story... Uh, the leader of the nerds, whose name I don't think we ever actually... Oh, no, wait, it's Norton. Okay. Assumes that Boomer has been taking drugs. And one of the rules for the nerds is nerds don't take drugs. Nerds stay clean. Again, just coming up with a group so that you can come up with weird rules and have them be a weird, cartoony bunch of guys for your hero to fight against. So from there, we're going to cut to our big splash page of the nerds all gathered together. And this is Byron. And Byron is a gigantic cyborg, uh, kind of in the vein of Overt Kill, I guess. This super cartoony style is really weird, again, with the Frank Miller script. And Norton here is going to give the nerds credo, I guess. We stay clean. We don't do drugs. We don't sell drugs. We eat our junk food, and we steal our electronics equipment, and we kill creeps. And Boomer says, I'm clean, Norton, I swear. And Norton says, we don't swear either, Boomer. We do what we're told. Because they're nerds, right? Again, a whole bunch of detail. You know, Todd isn't skimping on this, which is nice. I, you know, I, I don't think this is the story to go all out on. And he doesn't really feel like he's going all out, all out. But that really felt like issue eight, if anything. So Byron brings Boomer closer to Norton here so that he can just kind of face to face with him. And, you know, Boomer's just like, look, all I was saying was that maybe we should steer clear of the alley. That seems to be a bit of a problem. But Norton wants the alley because the alley gives them a corridor right near the heart of creep turf. So it's pivotal. So, like it or not, Spawn is stuck in the middle of a turf war. And he's going to have to come up with some strategic thinking so he doesn't deplete his magic meter thingy. Which was kind of the plot of issue 7. Which is like four issues before this. But okay. Again, kind of rehashing stuff we've already seen. Bit of a throwaway page. This is a standard shot for Todd now for Spawn. There's stuff here in the bottom, the buildings here. There's not a lot of it. And, you know, considering the overall quality of the page, I'm going to assume this is something Todd is able, again, to toss off. I've said this before, that Todd is able to toss off fairly quickly. It's just, it, man, it doesn't look like it. That looks like really freaking intricate. <laughs> so we're going to cut back to the alley where uh, Bobby and Boots are fretting over the dead creep that they're stuck with now. Trying to figure out what to do with her. At, and at that point... Some creeps show up with their own gigantic cyborg, and this is James. TM. I don't think you can TM James. And James is pretty much like Byron, only instead of the same kind of mean, he's more emotional. And he proves it by bursting into tears immediately. And he's going to go on a rampage as soon as he gets permission. And yeah, so these are our um, antagonists in this one. Bunch of dorky gang members. Being drawn super cartoony and then, you know, made really colorful. And it's the kind of thing that just feels a little bit embarrassing overall, really. Like, you wouldn't show this to anybody as like, yo, check out this comic. It'd just be kind of like, what, what is this horse shit, you know? <laughs> so James is going to show his displeasure by marking the alley in blood. So he's going to grab Bobby because he's the one with the most blood. I mean, between him and Boots, that makes sense. Uh, but at that point, he takes a big old shot from Spawn with the big anti-tank gun. And he stands at the end and just starts picking off all the creeps. I mean, except for James. He's, he's able to, you know, keep knocking uh, James over. But that's about all he can do. I like this shot here. You know, it's one of those things that uh, Todd likes to do now with the kind of silhouette where he does the outline of a silhouette. But, you know, stretching him down below the panel border, it's pretty cool. 
And just a big sound effect. It's economical as well in that he didn't have to draw a whole lot for that panel. But I like it. It works. And then we get an insert poster by Jeff Darrow. And I feel like I shouldn't have been talking about detail leading up to this. Because all of a sudden it's like, oh no, right, that's detail. And I hope to shit that Jeff got paid for this. I think he probably did. But every time I see a Jeff Darrow piece, like particularly a double page splash, it's like, oh my god, man. Like, that that looks like it ate up a year of your life. This gigantic thing just covered in gun belts and knives and miniguns. And a couple revolvers and, you know, just all sorts of junk. At least when you can tell what's going on. And there's like harnesses holding everything together. I feel like this thing makes sense to Jeff Darrow. I just can't, I can't see enough of it to confirm, you know. <laughs> and everybody just kind of milling about like, oh, isn't that something? And then uh, Rusty the Boy Robot. And the big guy, I think. It's not really the kind of thing that's in a Spawn comic, uh, although mostly just because it's out in public here. If this, if there was an alley here, that would be, you know, completely Spawn. I would like to check out some Darrow sometime. I don't think it, I don't even know how I'd talk about on the, that on the channel, so maybe that won't happen. But, like, you know, just to, like, have some Jeff Darrow art to check out, I think that would be quite enjoyable. And next issue... We're still going to get Rob Liefeld's Blood Wolf. I think that was back in issue 10 that was supposed to happen. But yeah, Liefeld can't even stay on schedule for like favor posters that he's giving his buddies. Okay, so from there, James is going to turn around. He's a super tough, uh, you know, gigantic cyborg guy. So naturally, he's got arms packed full of guns. Starts shooting back. Spawn thinks, okay, even if I beat this guy, there'll be more from both sides. I've got to create the situation. And of course, it's so simple. It's like, it better be. We're like halfway through the issue here. And not exactly a page Todd had to go super hard on. or he, he seems to be kind of taking it easy on this one. He's had like three splashes where he was allowed to go all out. So this other stuff is, it's yeah, he's going to kind of save some time on. Okay, so this is a splash that we're going to need to invest in. So Spawn uses his magicalistic power to summon a fireworks display. Although unlike his previous fireworks displays, this one has a purpose. Theoretically, anyway. So he puts on the light show. He's yelling about how all the creeps will die. The, the, the last battle will be fought here in the alley, which is apparently convincing to the creeps. Um, I'm not sure why they assume he's on the nerd's side, but I guess this is the first time they're encountering him. They might think he's some kind of new weapon or, you know, like new special soldier. And then he goes over to the nerd's side and says the same thing, saying the creeps will wipe out the nerds. And that's enough to get the creeps and the nerds to come out in force, like in totality, and meet at the alley for a big kind of battle to end it all. And, you know, I might have spoken too soon. This isn't super detailed stuff, at least these two aren't, except when you get to the alley. Every time you got to draw an alley, Todd's like, yeah, let me throw every single scrap of garbage I can think of in there. But, you know, it looks pretty good. It doesn't look like anything Frank Miller's writing. Like, it's so fucking colorful. And ridiculous. And you get magical spawn, like, floating around with his light shows. I don't know, it's so weird. And then you get one of those pages that Todd loves, where we don't see anything. We see a little bit of the collateral of a battle. You know, with the guy running in, immediately gets thrown back with the blood stain. Uh, I think that's a leg, maybe? It looks more like a gun, but it's got the splut sound effect and some blood coming out there. And yeah, a couple bodies, but more blood stains on the walls. And a whole bunch of sound effects. And yeah, Todd loves to do these pages instead of doing a battle. I mean, you know, a battle is a shit ton more time consuming. I'll give you that. It's also a lot more fun to read. Like, they basically spent an issue building up a battle, and then they're not going to show it. I don't know. That kind of stuff pisses me off a bit. But we're going to show the after effects. As Byron is the only one still standing. All of the creeps are dead, including James. All of the nerds are dead. So yeah, it's just Byron and Spawn left. And this one took some time. Like, cool angle and just dudes spread out everywhere. In all sorts of different levels of dismemberment. Looks like the creeps got it the worst, really. But maybe that's just down to the colorist. So yeah, now Byron believes that he rules the alley. And Spawn has to tell him what's what. Yeah, great splash. I would have traded this splash for an actual battle, but, you know, this is what we got. 
And he says, let's play Alien, which is kind of out of nowhere, and teleports inside of Byron so that he can explode out of him. Because the problem with uh, Cyborg, like Byron, is the armor, apparently. Five-layer Kevlar with a splash of an almost nuke-proof proton-heavy alloy. And uh, it's like the escape artist Houdini said about a bank vault he locked himself into. It's built to keep people out, not to keep people in. I don't know that that works with armor. But okay, and yeah, it just explodes out of him. That looks like a panel that uh, Frank Miller either drew or laid out, really. Like, it looks like a very loose Todd drawing up and around here. But yeah, Spawn himself looks more like a Frank Miller drawing. It's interesting. So yeah, Byron's dead. It's it's a fun idea for a kill. And, you know, executed fairly well with the fist punching out. And, you know, kind of the... It doesn't feel much like an explosion of gore, really. But, you know, it's more the idea of it, I guess. And then that's it for that war, really. You know, Spawn tosses the head aside... Bobby asks what's going to happen to the alley now, and Spawn goes, well, we let the cops clean it up, then we move back in, and life goes on. And we kind of go back to status quo, and nothing's changed. And another splash to end it on. There's been a lot of splashes in this issue. It does feel a bit like catching up. And yeah, I gotta say, as a fight, that was pretty disappointing. Like, you got the impression when he started talking about tactics, that it was going to be like a Yojimbo kind of thing, where he's playing the sides off of each other. It's not, it's just that both sides are kind of dumb. So, you know, when Spawn showed up and said, oh, I'm, I'm representing your hated rival, and we're going to kill you. They went, shit, no, we're going to kill you. For, and they both did that, and then they just killed each other. Like, nothing intricate at all. It's, it's the kind of thing, like, if you had it spread out over five or six issues, like, say, a Sin City-length storyline, you might have been able to turn that into something interesting. But in one issue, you got you don't have anywhere near enough time to make a memorable comic. The other thing that feels like it's maybe worth pointing out, if anything in this comic is, is they did go out of their way to point out Spawn's power meter. And, you know, because, again, we're, we're just at issue 11. So the power meter is like one of the major talking points in Spawn. And then over the course of this issue, he goes and heals up a hole in his chest, unnecessarily, arguably. That makes a point about having to think strategically presumably to avoid further power use, then does his fireworks displays, which we've seen eat up a whole bunch of power. Like over the first three issues, he used up like 1,500 units or whatever, just throwing extremely entertaining tantrums. Then he goes and teleports right at the end of the issue there. Like from what we've seen, he should be down to like half power by the end of this issue. That said, we didn't see the power meter itself over the course of the issue. So, I mean, if he wants to go and put it basically right where it was the last time we did see it, which I think was issue nine, I mean, is anybody even going to remember? Probably not, right? And yeah, so then some spawning ground stuff. Todd seems to like uh, a wordy letter. He's, there's maybe five letters on these two pages. And they all, and by the looks of it, they just kind of wander around a point for a while and, you know, just are more verbose than usual. And seem to think that Spawn is kind of heady. So, yeah, I can see how all of that would appeal to Todd. I mean, particularly given that's kind of his writing style, too. Okay, so that's it for Spawn number 11. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing, really. You know, like, halfway through it, I was thinking, maybe I'm just being too hard on this thing. I'm not having fun with it, you know? Like, it's just fun stuff with uh, big colorful gangs and they're, you know, shooting the shit out of each other or something. Well, I mean, we didn't see it, but... I think we can rest assured they were shooting the shit out of each other, and that's just as good. Honestly, it kind of feels like Frank just kind of wrote a thing that was super simple, uh, but expressly for the purpose of Todd throwing a whole bunch of color on top of it and going, I don't know, is that how the kids do it? Back in my day, it was just ninjas. Now I know it's all about the computers. But no, nah, I can't. Man. Yeah, it's, it's just it's boring and lamely written. And yeah, it's... Um, no, not not a particularly great comic, really. I mean, you don't hear a whole lot of people talk about this one. The other ones, you kind of do. I mean, particularly 8 and 9, I think. And those are the ones that Todd has kind of gone back to the well for in terms of developing the story of Spawn, as far as I can tell. I haven't read very much beyond, like, issue 20, but it sure seems like the stuff in those two issues pops up reasonably often. But, uh, yeah, they, they don't exactly go back... And explore any more about the history of the creeps and the nerds as far as I... You know what? I could be talking on my ass. They absolutely might. 
there might be like a like a twelve issue exploration on the history of the battles between the creeps and the nerds, just to kind of flesh things out. And because you need something to fill up pages in like issue one sixty through one sixty eight, who knows? And we may even get there eventually, but not any faster than one issue a month because I'm not reading that much Spawn if I can help it. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe. Hit the notification so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. That'll give you access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff, the pages, the finished comics, as well as the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, and some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and join the Blood Force Discord server, where you can drop some art, talk about some comics, talk about whatever the fuck you want, really. We've had discussions recently about a bunch of B-movies that I would like to have the patience for, but so deep down I suspect, eh, I don't really. But, <laughs> but the conversations are fun enough on their own. But anyway, that's going to do it. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.